When did you realize you had artistic talent? Oh boy. I think the first drawing that I can remember doing was in kindergarten. And I think that the teacher just said, you know, draw something that you like. And um, even back then, I was obsessed with alligators, as I'm still today obsessed with alligators. But um, uh, I, re I can remember drawing a, an alligator with, you know, green crayons, whatever. And um, I don't remember what it looked like exactly, but I do remember that people made a fuss about it. Like, hey, wow, that's a really good drawing. And I didn't really think that much of it. Um, until it kept happening. People kept like, like I, I'd win a prize for my drawing, you know, like in, in second grade or whatever. And, and then people started to say, oh, you know, Frankie's gonna be an artist when he grows up. Frankie's gonna be an artist when he grows up. And like, okay, I'm gonna be an artist when I grow up. Um, until I hit that stage, that teenage years where I was like, you can't tell me what I'm gonna be. <laughs> I'm not gonna be an artist, I'm gonna be an actor, you know, whatever. But, uh, but early, that early on, like, however old you are in kindergarten, four or five, something like that. Who did you want to emulate as an actor? Oh boy. I wanted to be, uh, at different stages, I wanted to be David Hedison, who was the star of Voyage to the Bottom of, of the Sea and the movie The Lost World from 1960, Irwin Allen's version of The Lost World. And I wanted to be David Hedison because he got to do all these cool things. He got to fight dinosaurs and he had to, you know, fight a giant spider and he did, uh, you know, he saved the girl and all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, and so the, in the 1960s, there were a lot of movies like Ray Harryhausen movies where there was a, a you know, a good looking hero who would fight monsters. And that was so appealing to me. So James Franciscus was another one that it was like, I'm, I'm gonna be James Franciscus without a doubt, you know? <laughs> and fight, fight Tyrannosaurus Rexes in, in the middle of the desert. But, uh, uh, you know, I, every, so every, every few years I would find another actor that I sort of glammed onto and it was like, that's who I'm gonna be. And I would, like George Siegel for many years. I, uh, that was in like high, early high school. I, I just love George Siegel, and so I, I, he wore a lot of these Irish sweat, uh, sweaters, <laughs> right? So I, I wore those all the time. My, I had my hair styled the way he did and everything like that. But uh, yeah, I, I was easily influenced <laughs> by, by my heroes. Where did you get the sweaters lip growing up in, was it upstate New York? Or, oh, or? they weren't, they were just knockoffs. They weren't oh, the I real see. Irish sweaters, oh. but they looked like the ones that George wore. So that was good enough. So are you you grew up in in uh, Long Island, right? Not yeah. I grew up um, I grew up on Long Island, um, which is off of uh, New York, um, uh, the North Shore of North, of Long Island, which is part of the reason I don't have the Long Island accent. Um, but that's also from comes from I think acting training as well. I think oh. you, mm -hmm. you you try to lose any any distinguishable act accent when you're, you're, you're planning to, do, uh, to be an actor because you don't want to be pigeonholed and as someone who, oh, who's only from this particular area, whatever. Um, unless you're going to go on The Sopranos and then, right. you know, then it works in your favor, obviously. I was going to say, yeah, a lot of shows now, it might actually work in your favor, <laughs> yeah. even if you're not from the East Coast. Although, I mean, if you look at, you look at The Walking Dead, half of that cast are from uh, Britain. You uh, mean you know, the governor and, and Rick Grimes, the, the, the lead, like they're, they're, uh, they're all from, from England. So, but apparently, apparently Southern is the easiest accent to learn if you're, if you're from there. Oh, interesting. That's what they tell me. Hmm. How would you spend your time as a kid? Drawing. Yeah. Um, drawing my own comic books, um, drawing monsters. So, one, probably the very first movie that I ever saw when I was maybe six, or this is at least that I can remember. This one stuck in my head. I was on my grandmother's house and, and you know, this gigantic TV, right? <laughs> Black and white TV. And Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Oh, wow. Was on. And I had never seen anything like that before. I was blown away by it. it was just the Wolfman and Dracula and Frankenstein and I don't think I even saw it as a comedy at that age you know I saw it I thought these monsters fascinated me I couldn't believe it and from that point on mostly what I drew were monsters 
So I would draw the Wolfman, I would draw Frankenstein, anything at all. And then Aurora uh, was a model kit company in the 1960s, and they, uh, uh, they came out with these monster models. And that became an, an obsession also, was building these models and painting them and everything like that. But it was always, it was monsters. I just loved monsters. And then even as a teenager, were you not, so you didn't sort of want to become the next Paul McCartney, you, you wanted to draw or be an actor? Yeah. What, yeah music definitely. and yeah, all and that didn't I, I don't think that I was particularly skilled in social graces. <laughs> and this is very common with uh, what we've discovered with kids that, that uh, what we call monster kids now. Uh, kids who, <laughs> like kids who are obsessed with, you know, the old classic monster movies and so forth is that, um, especially back in the 60s and you know, early 70s, there was no internet. There was a, you couldn't even, you know, you didn't even have VHS or anything like that. So when these movies came on television, it was an event. You know, you go, you go every week, run down to get the TV guide and flip through it and try to see if like if there are any cool monster movies showing that week, right? But we, there weren't. There were usually only one or two kids in your school that had the similar interest. And so uh, it could be a you know kind of a, a lonely existence actually, um, and at least at least because of your interest um, that uh, you'd spend a lot of time by yourself. Um, if you were lucky, there was another kid that you know you befriended who also loved that stuff, and then you could, you guys could draw together, you know? <laughs> and, or or make you know little Super Eight movies, which a lot of us did also. Um, but I, um, I, I think that um, I think I spent a good deal of the time drawing and um, and and cre creating is really maybe a better way to put it because it wasn't just drawing; it was sculpting things in clay and and uh, and writing up stories, uh, you know, writing writing scripts that we never would make, <laughs> but we we pictured making them quite a lot. I think that's probably common for a lot of movie fans, movie nerds, whatever, back in the day too, maybe, except for now with the DSLRs, it seems like everybody is doing it, but back in the day you sort of found refuge in these movies and it was like a safe place and, and those who didn't fit in, you yeah. know, myself included, it was, it was you, this is, these were my people right here, you know, yeah. and I felt good and, and kind of you feel safe amongst the the crowd in the movie theater or watching it on TV. Yeah, and when it, when it got to the uh, the early 70s, uh, the coolest thing happened, which was they started doing sci-fi conventions uh, in New York, Star Trek conventions. And and I wasn't like a Trekkie or whatever you want to call them. I, it wasn't, um, I wasn't obsessed with Star Trek, but I liked it a lot. And the Star Trek conventions would be more than just Star Trek. It would be science fiction in general. So there would be... People, there would be guys selling movie posters and, and stills and slides and all kinds of stuff that, um, that I started to collect uh, to uh, just basically plaster the walls of my room with. Right. Uh, yeah, so, but that also opened up the door to other people that were not in my town who had similar interests. So you might actually start a friendship, a, you know, a, a pen pals, we called them back then. Yeah, yeah. Where you're now writing to people that don't live in your town and comparing notes about movies and so forth. Oh, did you see Conquest of the Planet of the Apes? Yeah, you know, talk about it. Sure. It's great. Yeah, I found horror conventions so some of the nicest people. Oh, yeah. And you wouldn't, you'd say, oh, it's like, you know, and they're like, you know they look like Marilyn Manson or something, and they're actually the, the kindest people, whether you go to the opera and <laughs> not so much. They're the real monsters? <laughs> oh, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Growing up in New York, you said you grew up in Long Island, but in the, which shore? North Shore. North Shore, okay. Did you dream about coming to Hollywood? Or? Oh. oh, I definitely dreamt of coming to Hollywood. Um, I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know what the reality of it was, anything like that. Um, uh, I just, you know, what you saw on, how, how television portrayed Hollywood is what I thought Hollywood was. Like, you know, at the movie studio, you got a guy walking this way in a, in a, a suit of armor and a guy walking this way in a bunny <laughs> suit, you know, and they're like, hey, how are you, you know? Um, uh, I did not know the, uh, the amount of work involved uh, to get there, um, and the, 
uh, the patience <laughs> and the thick skin you needed and all those kind of things. But, you know, like, like a, lot, a lot of kids, just you had a picture of what it was like and you were going to go there and make movies and, and be James Franciscus fighting a dinosaur or whatever. And, and so definitely dreamed of it. And so when I would make my own little Super 8 movies, I would almost always be the star of it, you know, um, be able to, I could fight a dinosaur in my Super 8 movie at least, right? Um, but it was so far away from where I lived. You know, I, and if you grow up here and you see movies being made all the time down the street, you know, you run into, you can run into movie stars at the grocery store, et cetera. But where I was living, there were a couple of movie stars who lived out at the tip of Long Island in an area called Sands Point that was rather lucrative. Oh, cool. um, but that actually leads me to, to my first brush with real Hollywood. Uh, I was 18, I think, at that point. Um, and again, I didn't really have, at that point I hadn't really thought about like going to Hollywood and be working on movies. Um, uh, it was a nice dream, but I hadn't, wasn't gonna pursue it any further than that. And my friend, Scott, his parents um, owned uh, Nina Shoes, which is a huge shoe company. Um, back then. I don't know if it's still around or not. But they had this mansion in Sands Point, this very, you know, exclusive area. And he called me up one day and he said, uh, hey, listen, they're shooting a movie at my parents' house. You want to come over and like check it out? I was like, yeah, sure. And I didn't know what the movie was. And I get there and right off the bat, I had my <laughs> first experience of what it's like to be on a set because I got out of my car and I went up to somebody and I went to say, hey, do you know where Scott? And they turn around and they're like, shh. <laughs> right? Okay. And I didn't realize that, like, you really have to be quiet. You know, not just quiet, you have to be quiet. Right. So that was my first lesson, right? So I go, I go around to the back and I find Scott and a couple of my other friends were there. And they're shooting a scene in the, the, the back part of the house. And I look over and there's Robert De Niro and Jerry Lewis and Martin Scorsese is sitting behind the camera. They were shooting the King of Comedy there. A uh, big scene actually in the film. Um, and I didn't know the plot, obviously. Um, I, I think they made, Scott maybe filled me in a little bit of what it was, but I, this, was, this blew my mind. I was like, oh my God. Like, and I'm, and I'm looking around and seeing everything that's going into it, all the trucks and the generators and the lights and the cameras and the, you know, the people doing all these different things. You know? And um, I, was, I was just, it, it really just blew my mind. Um, I, 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 I felt like it was a dream, you know? And at one point they broke for lunch and everybody, so the whole set sort of cleared away and I, I walked in there by myself and there was this living room, and it was set up with, uh, with pictures of Jerry Lewis with different people because it was supposed to be his house, right? And, and, I, saw, and, I, and I saw this sign that said, do not touch, hot set. And I was thinking that it meant that it was physically hot. <laughs> I was going to burn my hand if I put my hand on anything. <laughs> I would find out later that it just means, you know, that... It's a working set, so you can't, you can't move anything or touch anything. But uh, it was an amazing experience. And I, then I definitely said, okay, this is a real thing. This is, this is something that you can do. How you get there, I'll, I'll figure that out somehow. You know? But uh, I, it was, it was eye-opening. Do you go back and watch that scene? Oh, yeah. Oh. I just watched it um, uh, maybe a, couple of months ago again. And you know, and watching that scene in particular, uh, was uh, just all the memories just come flooding back and thinking like, wow, this was this was a key moment. Like probably, probably Albert Adam Costello and B. Frankenstein was the first one. King of Comedy was the second one. For sure. <laughs>